Trump's Mar-a-Lago home earlier this week. We do know a federal judge had given former President Donald Trump's attorneys until 3 p.m. Eastern today to respond to Attorney General Merrick Garland's motion to release these documents, including the property receipt along with that warrant. That property receipt lists the items taken from the site. The former president, Donald Trump, overnight saying he would not oppose releasing the documents. In fact, his legal team had the documents in hand, it's believed, since earlier this week and could have released them uh, themselves. Again, ABC News obtaining what appears to be the actual warrant now. Also, the receipt for property. That receipt does, in fact, show 11 sets of classified documents. In fact, one set of documents are marked as classified SCI documents referring to top secret sensitive compartmented information, meaning only a select few would have access to these documents. Let's get right to our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, tracking this with me all week long. And John, this is significant. They went in to find documents and it would appear they found at least uh, some of what they were looking for. 11 separate entries referencing classified information and they list uh, the level of classification as well, David. Uh, secret, top secret, and as you mentioned, uh, top secret SCI, uh, the highest, one of the highest levels of classification, something that uh, few people in, uh, in, in, in the government have access to and must always be reviewed in a secure location. Uh, something other, other thing very significant here is it describes uh, the potential statutes, uh, the potential laws that were broken. Uh, one of those is the Espionage Act, Espionage Act. Uh, but another one is obstruction of justice. And uh, this document, uh, the, uh, the warrant, uh, says that one of the things they were looking for, and this is a direct quote, any evidence of knowing alteration, destruction, or concealment of any government and or presidential records of any documents with classified markings. Uh, so this shows it's, it's about classified information and handling information, but it's also uh, looking for evidence of obstruction of justice, uh, which means uh, that this could be related to other investigations beyond uh, his handling of, of, of government records. Uh, you know, the January 6th committee uh, had pursued all his presidential records, won a case that went to the Supreme Court to get ac uh, access to presidential records at the National Archives. Uh, you know, potentially you see a situation where Donald Trump uh, had presidential records that were not turned over to the National Archives and therefore not turned over to investigators as, be re as required by a court. John Carl, stay with us here because I want to put back on the screen uh, for a follow-up question to you. Back on the screen, this graphic that actually shows the levels of classification here. Confidential records found, uh, top secret confidential records. Uh, if you go up the list there, so confidential, secret, and then what John and I were talking about at the top there, top secret uh, TS documents, SCI documents. This means top secret, sensitive, compartmented information. And John, just to make this uh, very clear for people watching us at home, that means a very select few people within the administration would even have access to this, uh, let alone the idea that these documents would somehow end up at the president's home after he left office. Uh, to, to give you an idea of how highly classified, uh, David, uh, Jared Kushner, who is obviously not only the president's son-in-law, but was a very uh, senior advisor in the Trump White House, uh, he actually never during the four years uh, got a security clearance that allowed him to get access to SCI programs. Uh, after, a, after a fight with, uh, with the chief of staff at the time, John Kelly, he eventually got top secret clearance, but not even Jared Kushner uh, had the clearance uh, to view uh, SCI intelligence. So yes, this is very sensitive intelligence uh, that is uh, available only to a select uh, few people that go through very strict background checks uh, to be able to get access to under and, limited and, circumstances. And one more quick question for you, John. We've been reporting all week long here on uh, Republicans in Congress, uh, supporters of the former president who've been asking for more information on what was discovered at Mar-a-Lago. They've been pressing the Justice Department all week. Uh, but you have reported from the very beginning that it's believed that the former president himself, uh, his legal team, had this list that's now been made public here uh, through what we've obtained. They've had this list since earlier this week. They could have, if they had wanted to, answered these questions already. Yeah, Donald Trump and his uh, legal team could have put this list out. Uh, Monday, uh, the timestamp that we have from when he got the list of materials uh, that were taken from Mar-a-Lago was, to be exact, uh, David, 6.19 p.m. on Monday. After that point, Donald Trump could have made any of this uh, public uh, and chose not to.
Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas also with us. John, thank you. Let's let's turn to Pierre now because Pierre, uh, we know that Merrick Garland uh, is, uh, he, he loathes to go in front of the camera, does not talk about cases while they're underway. He came before the cameras this week and offered only a statement, did not take questions, uh, simply to say that he uh, personally approved this search. He indicated that uh, strongly indicated that other routes had been taken to try to avoid a search like what played out in front of the country uh, down at Mar-a-Lago and clearly frustrated with uh, the threats against law enforcement, the FBI, in light of this search. Uh, he obviously knew full well, Pierre, what had been obtained at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, this list uh, will, will help to make the case, at least for now, that this was no political whim. They were looking to find documents, Pierre, and it would appear from what we see here in this property receipt that they found at least 11 sets of top secret and classified documents. David, make no mistake, what we're talking about here is extraordinary. And I was speaking with a source familiar with uh, this case, and they made it clear, the source made it clear that this was something that the FBI and the Justice Department felt that they had to do. Emphasize the word phrase, had to do, meaning that they believed that there was documents, there were documents on the Mar-a-Lago property that were classified, top secret, and of national security implications. And there came a point when information came in that this information was still there under questionable security, and the, the, the decision was made, we need to go get this material. And David, the list here that we're talking about, and you mentioned a number of times, the TSSCI documents. Now, I've had the uh, ability to go to the NSA and some of the more secure facilities uh, in the government. And when they talk about skiffs, these are rooms that are impervious to electronic eavesdropping. You're not allowed to take any kind of uh, electronic device in them. So in other words, this kind of material, A, must be viewed by only the highest levels of government, and B, it must be viewed in a circumstance that cannot be penetrated, period, because of the level of sensitivity. And David, as you mentioned, law enforcement deeply concerned by all the threats uh, that have been made, including the incident in Cincinnati, uh, that they're investigating whether this man was motivated by this, the, the search of uh, President, former President Trump's property. And the bottom line is that Merrick Garland felt strongly that the time had come to speak, and to start to give some level of information about why they felt necessary, felt it necessary to go into the resort. And Pierre, what are the obvious questions moving forward? And there will be so many of them, but one of them would be who, who transported these documents? Why would they take them with them after leaving office? What was the purpose of that in storing not just a classified document, but multiple sets of them uh, at the former president's home in Florida long after leaving office? David, that's the, that's the most curious question of all of us. Why were there 25-plus boxes of materials at Mar-a-Lago? And I'm just struck by the number of instances where they say miscellaneous secret documents, top-secret documents, even on the SCI documents, various. So we're talking about multiple, multiple items. When they looked into these files, they saw these designations on the material. They're labeled as such so people know, do not look at this if you're not authorized. And so it's it's a incredible situation that we have, and we don't yet know all the detail because we have not yet seen the affidavit for the search warrant, which t would tell us in more detail why they went to the lengths that they went. But these statutes that are involved here are felony statutes, espionage, mishandling of documents. Uh, this is a very serious situation. I just want to make it very clear for those at home watching our live coverage here. Uh, ABC News obtaining the warrant uh, used to search former President Trump's home at Mar-a-Lago earlier this week and the list of property, the list of items taken uh, from his home. And I want to bring in John Santucci, who has reported on Donald Trump for many years, uh, both the campaign and the presidency and now the post-presidency. And John, uh, you were telling me before we came on the air that you have learned uh, through your sourcing that the Trump legal team, uh, not only President Trump overnight saying go ahead and release this, but the legal team uh, agreed with him late today. David, just as in the last couple of minutes, that judge gave a 3 o'clock deadline for Trump's lawyers to respond, and they did. Trump's attorneys have told the federal court in Florida that the former president 
does not object to the release, wants the document out there. Uh, and, David, we, we should note that, you know, this is a document that uh, has been a back-and-forth consternation within Trump's orbit, whether or not to block the release. I mean, as John Carl and Pierre just outlined for our viewers, uh, it's not a good document for the former president. There are significant issues brought up in this disclosure that we're learning now between the Espionage Act, the top secret documents that were taken. And I got to tell you, David, all night I was hearing a variety uh, of plans of what would happen on behalf of the former president. We're going to block it. We're not going to block it. Back and forth, back and forth. And in the end, the argument that won was that, well, let's just get it out there because we have nothing to hide. And that ultimately is where we find ourselves this afternoon. Uh, you know, the only other point I would bring up, David, is that, you know, there is a question among Trump's most loyalists of why all of this was brought down there. I know you just mentioned that with Pierre, but, you know, speaking to a source very close to the former president, they said, well, you, you know, you know him. He just takes everything with him. He, he, he wants to have memorabilia in some cases. You do have to ask the question, what is the benefit? What is the memorabilia behind top secret information? What would you plan to do with that? Uh, and that is going to be something that investigators are going to be asking. We already know, as we reported last night, Captain Falls and I, that so many of Trump's aides have been brought in, have been questioned, in some cases, David, certain individuals multiple times by federal investigators about these documents. So if anything, this is just the beginning of what is certainly going to be a very long, long, long process. And certainly our audience watching recognizes at home that these documents belong to the American people, the U.S. government, and not any former president uh, once they leave office. Uh, John, one more question to you. You talk about the, the debate overnight, uh, obviously both a legal debate, a political debate, but uh, even the president himself, the former president, demanding answers all week long publicly, uh, his supporters demanding answers, Republican leaders on the Hill demanding answers. Uh, wouldn't it have looked strange uh, for the former president to have blocked this, giving, uh, given the fact that he had many of these answers all week long? And, David, that is one of many questions we have been asking, and many people close to the former president have been asking that question, too. Look, you, you have to recognize, as we all do, uh, in some ways the Trump world has succeeded in spinning this as a good narrative for them. They have been blasting out fundraising emails every hour in some cases, trying to cash in on the benefit of uh, Joe Biden's government, in their words, going after them. So it, it does raise the question as to, well, why wouldn't you put this out there sooner if you had nothing to hide. It's definitely going to be uh, a question that many are going to have to uh, look into. And I do think, David, you know, it, it is also that question of how did the FBI learn about this? You know, we know from all of our reporting over the years of Donald Trump's team, if there's one thing that Donald Trump obsesses over, it is the leaks. It is the hunt. I remember uh, back during the first campaign, uh, they were trying to figure out who had wiretaps uh, in his campaign offices. Um, I mean, this is not uh, new behavior. This is Donald Trump pre-presidential politics, um, always obsessing with who is out there uh, trying to get him. So you've got to wonder as well, David, what is happening inside Trump's close-knit team, what is happening in Bedminster right now, where the former president is, and certainly watching coverage of people talking about the new information we've learned today. They've got to be wondering who was that person or persons that told the FBI where to go find these boxes. John Santucci with us, John, who has covered uh, Donald Trump for, again, many years for us here at ABC. I want to bring in our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, Dan, because you've been studying uh, both the warrant and the, the property receipt here. Can you take us through these criminal uh, statutes uh, that have been uh, revealed in what we've now obtained here? Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that's most striking about these criminal statutes is that oh, for two of the three statutes that are specifically mentioned here, you may not even need for the documents to have been quote unquote classified, right? I mean, one of the arguments that the Trump team has been making is that the president declassified all of this. And the president does have the power while you're president, not after the fact, to declassify just about everything. Now, there's a discussion, a debate about what that means and does, is there a process that has to move forward upon doing that? But putting that aside for a minute, Two of the three statutes at issue, that wouldn't even really matter that much. 
I mean, one of the two statutes, um, 18 U.S. Code 1519, relates to the destruction, alteration, or falsification of records. And you're talking there about someone who is concealing, mutilating, destroying any record, document, or tangible object, etc. That is the statute I am singularly most interested in here as to what they may have. Now, you've heard reference to the Espionage Act as well. That is something, by the way, the same particular provision that came up in the context of the Hillary Clinton investigation. Um, This is one that doesn't specifically have to relate to classified information. It can relate to anything related to the national defense. And if a person through, quote, gross negligence permits it to be removed from its proper place of custody or delivered to anyone in violation of his trust, et cetera, et cetera, that could be a very serious felony there. So I guess as I look at these statutes, I'm focused less on the question that the Trump team has been talking about, which is the classification of the documents, which is obviously very important uh, in a macro picture. But in a strictly legal sense, two of these three statutes, that may not even be the critical question. Dan Abrams tracking this all week long with us as well. Dan, stay with us here. I want to bring in John Cohen, formerly with the FBI, obviously an ABC News consultant. John, always great to have you. Uh, Obviously for the bigger picture here, and we've been talking uh, at great length about the level of classification for many of these documents. Again, for those watching at home, 11 sets of classified information among the property uh, taken from Mar-a-Lago earlier this week. And as I mentioned earlier, one set of documents marked uh, as classified include these top secret uh, SCI documents. That's an abbreviation to top secret sensitive compartmented information. Uh, And John, you know better than any of us on the air right now that that means uh, a very small number of people would ever have access to those documents and in very specified locations, certainly not the residence of a former president. That's exactly right, David. Uh, TSSCI information or intelligence is highly sensitive uh, and it's, it is marked or classified as top secret SCI bec- in acknowledgement that the disclosure of that information would, would incur grave harm to the national security of the United States. Look, let me just say I've had security clearances most of my career. When you're granted access to classified information, you make a commitment to the United States government, the U.S. people, that you will safeguard the security of that information from inappropriate from uh, from inappropriate disclosure, whether intentional or unintentional. That's why there are such strict rules governing how that information is stored, where it can be looked at, how it can be transported. Uh, and I am sure that investigators uh, are very, very would be very, very concerned about classified information that was transported from the White House uh, in an unsecured way to Mar-a-Lago, and they would be concerned that that classified information would be uh, unintentionally or even worse, intentionally disclosed to those who intend the United States harm. And John, I know a lot of people watching at home are going to be scratching their heads. You know, is this simply sloppy or is there something more sinister going on here? And I know that's a question you can't answer. But why would a former president uh, take boxes of documents, uh, including uh, so much of what's been found here, to be marked as classified and top secret? Not just top secret, but the highest classification uh, of, of documents that would only be seen again by a select few. Uh, It is perplexing. Uh, That is probably the question that the uh, investigators are looking at closely. Uh, What they will want to make sure is that there was no intention to provide those documents or that information to a foreign power who seeks to injure or create harm against the United States. That's the number one reason why these investigations are done. So this isn't some superficial, you know, issue about somebody accidentally taking home some documents they shouldn't take home. The key question investigators will be seeking to answer is, were those documents removed from the White House intentionally, and were they removed with the intention to provide them to a foreign power or to some other uh, entity that did not 
should not have access to that information. And let me ask you, John, if investigators conclude at the end of this investigation that there was no sinister plot here, no plan to use those documents or to provide them to uh, foreign adversaries, if you will, or any of the other scenarios that you just laid out, uh, if they de determine that that's not the case, at the very least, there are serious questions still about why uh, documents of, of this level of classification would end up not only leaving the White House, but leaving these uh, very secure locations uh, where small groups of people would have access to them in the first place. Yes, absolutely. Even if there was no intent to provide them to a foreign power or to some other um, organization for illicit purposes, um, there are still requirements under law that prevent um, or that uh, sanction uh, the inappropriate handling of classified information. Uh, I mean, we remember Sandy Berger uh, got into trouble because he removed classified information from the National Archives. Um, so, you know, for, for everybody except for the President of the United States, uh, this type of activity would result, uh, highly likely would result in them never being able to access classified information uh, ever again. Um, the, the president is kind of a unique animal in the world of uh, classification and classified documents. He, uh, and so the, the only way that I can presume that, that Donald Trump will ever regain access to classified information again, based on the circumstances we know, will be as if he's reelected as president. That's a big if. John Cohen, uh, formerly with the FBI and ABC News analyst that we turn to often in these situations, although this one is extremely unprecedented. Uh, John, uh, thank you. I want to bring in uh, our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, obviously a uh, co-anchor of this week, covered the Trump administration for years as well. And Martha, you were exploring this issue of security clearance for former presidents all day long here. And, uh, you know, we needed to refresh our memories about whether or not every former president gets automatic clearance or whether that is simply standard operating procedure and, and a current sitting president would decide whether the, the, the immediate former president would have access. And you learned um, something that's uh, rather enlightening here. Uh, that's right, David. They don't get an automatic security clearance when they leave office. In fact, the only reason they get a security clearance is because they are in office, because he was president of the United States. And Joe Biden, very early on, decided that Donald Trump would no longer have intelligence briefings. Now, it is standard. If you look over history, uh, presidents afforded that opportunity to former presidents, just sort of a, a courtesy, yes, if you need an intelligence briefing on something, you can have it, but not with Donald Trump. The only reason he obtained a security clearance is because he was elected president. Now, others like, like uh, John Brenner, Brennan, the former CIA director, they can maintain that security clearance after they leave, but they have to have it refreshed. They are investigated. They obtain that through a security clearance, through, through a vetting. And so this case with Donald Trump is very different. He no longer has a security clearance. And David, I, I also want to bring up one of the things the world is watching with these documents is how that intelligence was obtained. That's in these secret documents normally as well, how the U.S. obtained that intelligence. And that is something that truly concerns the FBI and others. And just to underscore another point, Martha, here, stick with us, because I wanted to ask you, just given your uh, travel around the world with leaders of this country and leaders of other countries as well, you've seen them as they go into these skiffs, into these very secure locations. Pierre uh, alluded to this earlier, where, you know, your cell phone won't even work, where all electronics are sort of jammed in that moment to protect, uh, just as you say, intelligence gathering, how we received our information, the U.S. intelligence agencies. Uh, and so the idea that there would be, you know, not just a document or two, but 11 sets of classified documents all the way up to the very top secret uh, classification found uh, off the property, not only of the White House, but of secure locations at a White House uh, would seem to be extremely significant today. It, it is extremely significant. These so-called skiffs, these areas where they can go in and actually read these sort of documents are set up. Donald Trump had one at Mar-a-Lago Mar when he was president, a small area uh, that they felt was secure, that was protected. Uh, that was, of course, taken down as soon as he was no longer president. These skiffs are all over the world in embassies, uh, in different agencies in Washington, D.C., and they are specific standards, how they are set up, who can go in there, and what they can read. 
Martha Raddatz with us as we continue our reporting here. Uh, again, as you've been watching here, ABC News has now obtained the search warrant used by the Department of Justice to search Mar-a-Lago uh, earlier this week, the former president's home. As you can see on your screen, this is on the list of the property receipt that came attached with the search warrant. Uh, expected to be made public uh, this afternoon. 11 sets of classified information, including some marked as top secret, an executive grant of clemency for Roger Stone, handwritten notes, information about the president of France, uh, binders of photos, 27 boxes uh, in all. Again, uh, extreme focus here uh, as we get our first look at the warrant and this list are on the, on the classified documents, the level of classification going to the very uh, top. I want to bring in Aaron Katursky, our investigative reporter uh, who's been working the case since the beginning beginning of the week as well. And Aaron, a lot of people at home are going to wonder, uh, you're given this warrant, you can show up. We know through ABC News reporting that the FBI uh, notified the Secret Service at Mar-a-Lago. They didn't notify the staff until moments before the FBI moved in. Uh, a question many people have had is once they go in with a search warrant looking specifically for whatever the list is, uh, if they find other things during that search, is it fair game? Not always, David. And in fact, the FBI agents were not allowed to search the entirety of the property. They were given, though, a fairly wide berth, according to this search warrant document that we've been able to obtain. It shows that the FBI agents could search former President Trump's office, labeled 45 Office, any storage room, and any facility, really, where boxes or documents could be stored. Off-limits were rooms that were used by members of the golf club at Mar-a-Lago and also private guest suites used by the former president and his staff. The agents were not allowed to search in those locations, David. Aaron Katursky with us live here as well. Aaron, our thanks to you. I want to bring back in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Uh, ABC News learning that the judge has moved forward about to release these documents expected at any moment, given the fact that Merrick Garland this week came before the cameras and said the Department of Justice has said release the warrant. He said out of an abundance of uh, interest in this country it was an understatement uh, when, when he delivered that statement, an understatement indeed, given the fact that this is unprecedented, historic. It involves a former president, this search. Uh, Merrick Garland making it clear, we'll put the warrant out there. John Call reporting very early this week that the former president had the warrant in hand, the list of property, at least his legal team did and could have released it themselves. We learned overnight from the former president himself that he would not block it. And from John Santucci here moments ago reporting that the legal team uh, had no, uh, at the end of the day today at least, after debate, political debate, legal debate within that team, would not stand in the way of this being released, expected at any moment now. And John, I want to come back to you because you've also been reporting all week long on reaction uh, from leadership on the Hill, particularly from Republican leadership, uh, defending uh, the former president, demanding answers from the Department of Justice. And I'm curious, uh, it's probably too early to know what the reaction to this will be, uh, but this will be an evolution of their defense of the former president, given the list. Uh, and, and even though this is a somewhat generic list, we, we know 11 sets of classified information, including these very top secret documents, how that will be defended on the Hill. You know, it'll be a test, another test. There have been many of just how devoted uh, Republicans are and Republican leaders, Republicans in position of authority and responsibility are to Donald Trump, regardless of the facts. Uh, it was striking, David, to see Republican leaders, including the Republican leader in the House, the very top uh, Republican in the House uh, who uh, may well be the Speaker of the House come next year, uh, Kevin McCarthy, on Monday evening, I mean, just after uh, news of this uh, execution of the search warrant uh, happened on Monday, come out and to attack the Department of Justice, uh, to suggest the Department of Justice was acting in a political way and to essentially threaten the Attorney General of the United States, telling him uh, to keep his calendar clear and to preserve his documents uh, because uh, he, you know, they were going to be investigating uh, if the Republicans, he actually said when Republicans uh, take over the House. Uh, we haven't heard from McCarthy yet today, at least I haven't seen. Uh, but what you have in this uh, warrant and in this list of items uh, taken is uh, clearly from uh, the FBI, unless you think the FBI is all making stuff up, which is a, a, an outrageous uh, a thing to say. Uh, how are Republican leaders going to respond to the fact that Donald Trump had so much material, 22 boxes in all, uh, uh, 11 
box, I'm sorry, 27 boxes in all, 11 boxes containing classified information, some of the information at the top secret SCI level. What are they going to say now? Are they going to continue to, without any uh, uh, further evidence, uh, defend Trump at all costs and to attack the Department of Justice? Or are they going to say, uh, this is something that needs to be looked at. Yeah, that's going to be a real test, and you'll report that out uh, even in the hours ahead, John. While you were uh, reporting there, John, we should note that the order to unseal came through from uh, the magistrate judge, uh, Bruce Reinhardt. The United States moves to unseal the search and seizure warrant. Uh, it goes on to say the court, having reviewed the motion and being otherwise fully advised, it is ordering that the motion is granted, uh, done, uh, and ordered. And so as we came on the air, ABC News had obtained the warrant, the, the list of property uh, seized from Mar-a-Lago. While we've been on the air, uh, that has now been released to the public uh, from the judge uh, involved in this case. And I want to bring back in our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, who covers the attorney general, of course, the Department of Justice. Uh, and Pierre, there were many questions Monday. It seems like it was weeks ago, but it was only a few days ago about uh, whether or not Merrick Garland would talk at all in this case. Uh, generally, as is precedent, uh, the attorneys general do not talk uh, while a case is underway. Uh, he did come forward before the American people saying, I will make a statement because it was the former president himself who on Monday evening went public with the search uh, at Mar-a-Lago, and he came forward to tell the American people that he personally approved of this, indicated that several other routes had been taken before this very public route of searching the residence of a former president. Uh, and uh, he also made it clear, uh, Merrick Garland did when he spoke to the American people, that he would push for this warrant to be released, given the fact that there had been so many questions about what the FBI was looking for. Obviously, the former president, Pierre, could have revealed that. He was given that list that very day. But now, as we've been on the air here, that list has now been made public for the American people. David, it has, and I'm looking at the the, the warrant and the inventory, it matches uh, the earlier reporting that we have to a T. It is consistent with the document that uh, we were able to review. So it's done. It's released. It's uh, exactly what we've been discussing. And, and David, you, you make a very relevant point. This is a former appellate judge. He is extremely careful about how he conducts business. He talks often about the rule of law. But one of the things I should make note of about Merrick Garland, although he is quiet and low key, uh, there is no doubt that the man is viewed in many circles as incredibly tough. And the example, example I would give you is that he was the lead investigator involving the Oklahoma City bombing for the Justice Department. And that case had a lot of controversy tied to it in terms of how wide the conspiracy was. And I remember at the time, he was dogged in just saying, we will go after the facts, we will charge those people who were involved, and many people wanted a vast conspiracy, many different people to be uh, charged. That's not ultimately what they found, and he was willing to live with that. So he's a person who speaks softly, but he does have significant resolve, and I can tell you that there had been some level of frustration with people saying that the Justice Department had been dragging its feet in regard to anything involving former President Trump. Um, his answer and those close to him have been, we will follow the facts and you'll see the results at the appropriate time. Well, particularly given the historic nature of what we've watched unfold this week and in these polarized uh, times, I can say of Pierre and this entire team, everyone has been so careful uh, and steady all week long in reporting this out. The receipt uh, for property now up on your screen, and that does match what ABC News had obtained before we came on the air here a short time ago. Again, uh, included in that list, 11 sets of classified documents, including some marked as uh, top uh, secret. And as we have reported uh, in depth here, that means it's meant to be only uh, seen uh, in special government facilities by a select number of people within uh, a current administration. Uh, significant questions uh, on so much of what was discovered, but in particular those those top secret documents, how they ever made their way uh, to Mar-a-Lago, to the residence of a former president. Uh, I want to bring back in uh, Dan Abrams uh, as we look at this receipt for property. Uh, and, and Dan, we knew the warrant would be somewhat uh, generic in nature and, and the list of property, but it's also striking what we can glean from what's been released. Yeah, 
I have to say that there's actually a little bit more detail than I had expected would be the two appendixes uh, that are attached uh, to the warrant itself. Uh, because sometimes you'll see a search warrant that's uh, much more generic uh, than is this one. The thing we were looking for primarily was what statutes, what possible crimes uh, were they investigating here? Remember that a judge signed off on this warrant with probable cause that a crime was committed. In order to get this search warrant, the government had to prove to the judge that there was probable cause a crime was committed and that uh, there was a likelihood that there would be evidence found. That was the burden that they first had to achieve. That information is largely in the affidavit, which we do not have. But in this warrant itself, being able to see, A, what the statutes were that they were investigating, and B, that the items that they collected, and I think that the detail that we're getting that maybe I wasn't expecting was uh, the level of classification on the various documents, right? I expected that maybe there would be references to X number of documents were found here. And as we've seen in some parts of the warrant, it talks about a box with a number on it doesn't specify, but there is, there is specification here. There is some specificity, I should say, here with regard to the classification, the top secret nature of, you know, at, at least 11 uh, sets of documents. So that is a, a little bit surprising and certainly provides us with a little more information than I had expected. And certainly uh, to defenders at the beginning of the week who said, you know, this better not be about a, a uh, many defenders were likely hoping for earlier in the week. And look, David, I was saying, I mean, I was saying this better not be a presidential records violation, right? This better not just be a bookkeeping, a record keeping issue um, that, oh, you know, he was supposed to turn some stuff over and he didn't turn it over in time. You know, I, I said that in Good Morning America, and, 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 and I still believe it. Um, this definitely does suggest that there was more to it. But it's not just the classification of the documents. It's also the fact, and you and I have talked about this, the fact that we know that there was a previous subpoena issue, meaning they had tried other ways to get this material. And that's why I'm very interested in the statute in particular, that refers to potentially concealing information. Is the government alleging that he was intentionally trying to hide this from them? Um, that's the sort of thing that takes this to another level. The, the, the level of classification, that's one part. The second part is the fact that the government tried to get it in other ways. As Merrick Garland said in his press conference yesterday, they, they tried to use the least intrusive means, as they always do, he said. And this was, in the, uh, from the perspective of the Department of Justice, the only way, the final straw, so to speak, in terms of getting uh, these documents back. Right. Dan Abrams, who's been with us all week long. Dan, thanks. Just a few moments left here in our special report. And as we mentioned earlier, it bears repeating. Uh, the former president, uh, his lawyers, said they did not object to the warrant and property receipt uh, being released here uh, mid-afternoon on a Friday at the end of the week that began uh, with the search at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, John Carl, you have reported uh, all week long it would be somewhat uh, peculiar, uh, to say the least, had they tried to block this, knowing the fact that they had it in hand at the beginning of the week and had pressed for answers from the Justice Department all week long. Yes, and uh, Donald Trump had gone out on his own social media platform and called for the release, so it would have been hard for them to actually go through and to try to block it at court. So it's out. Uh, David, as we've discussed, there are uh, further documents that would describe why the Justice Department uh, felt the need uh, to go in uh, the way they did and also outline why they believe there was probable cause and why a judge agreed there was probable cause uh, that the search would reveal evidence of crimes. That document uh, has not been made public yet, but there is a, uh, there is a lawsuit by uh, several news organizations underway to get that released as well. But right now, we have a pretty clear picture of what was going on and 
why the FBI uh, at, 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 and the Justice Department decided that this was something that they needed to do and do very quickly. And you're standing in front of the White House, obviously. Viewers at home don't need me to point that out, but I bring that up only because the Biden administration said this week that they had not been informed uh, that this search was coming, uh, underscoring the separation between the White House, this current president, and the Department of Justice. But Biden has been, President Biden has been absolutely clear that Merrick Garland uh, was to do, make any decisions related to anything regarding uh, the, the, the previous president uh, with independence, uh, no interference from the White House. Uh, David, they claim that they didn't even know that Garland was holding that press conference yesterday and that Garland was going to call for the release of these documents. They say that they have been kept in the dark by the Justice Department, and that is very much by design uh, that Biden believes uh, that the Justice Department must be independent on matters like this and not have any political influence. John Carl on the North Lawn of the White House, where they're mowing the lawn at this hour. John, thank you. Uh, as we pour through this warrant and this uh, list of property seized from Mar-a-Lago, I want to bring back in Pierre Thomas, our Chief Justice Correspondent. Pierre, uh, we're going to go off the air at 4 o'clock uh, here in the East. For many of you, your local news is standing by, so stay tuned for that. But a key question for you, Pierre. You know, John pointed this out, that the Biden administration, the current president, didn't even know that Merrick Garland was going to go before the American people until the White House was asked by reporters about it uh, once the Department of Justice alerted us uh, that to, to be ready that the AG uh, was about to speak underscores again this separation between the Attorney General uh, and the President. So what comes next, Pierre, for people watching this right now? I mean, we don't expect to hear from Merrick Garland anytime soon, and in fact, this could go on uh, for weeks and, dare I say, months to come. It could indeed, and I think what you will see is an effort to get the affidavit for the search warrant, which would go into greater detail as to why they went into the property. Uh, I think the Justice Department will probably push back on that for a period of time because there are certain things that they may not want President Trump or people around him to know about what they are pursuing. Uh, that is a possibility. But right now, they are going to go over these documents, David. They're going to look very closely at them to see if there's any uh, suggestion that they've been altered in any way. They're going to go back to people that they've interviewed uh, to talk about what they know about these documents. And there's a lot more work to be done to answer the basic question of why. Why were those documents there in the first place? And with just a few moments left, I want to bring back in Martha Raddatz for one final thought here. Martha, the notion of these documents and the level of classification, just to remind our audience, only certain people within a current administration will be able to view some of these documents, and they would only be able to view them in key, very select places that were completely secure from outside communication. It's exactly, David extremely secure locations. No one could monitor them. No one could get in who did not need to know what that specific information was. And David, I am struck on these documents by just reading and remembering this is about a former president that the FBI wanted to seize physical documents constituting evidence, contraband, fruits of crime, or other items illegally possessed in violation of the law. That's what they were looking for. That's why this is so important. Martha Raddatz with us here this afternoon as well. Again, our coverage continues on ABC News Live, abcnews.com. Uh, I'll be back with this entire team for World News Tonight as we have a little more time to pour through this warrant and the list of properties seized from Mar-a-Lago and what this could mean uh, moving forward. For many of you, your local news is standing by. I'm David Muir in New York. I'll see you a short time from now. Good day. This has been a special report from ABC News. To David, we are continuing to follow that breaking news. The release of the warrant used in the FBI search of former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate and the receipt for property showing agents found 11 sets of classified documents. With me now, we bring in Josh Margolin first up. So, Josh, what is your reaction to this? It's obviously the, these are serious documents. The, the laws they're investigating the possible crimes are serious, and it should uh, give a rest to the issue or the question as to whether or not what was being sought in the raid was important enough for the FBI to proceed with a search, uh, an unannounced search, with a search warrant and a raid of Mar-a-Lago. Aaron, you're with the conversation with us as well. What stood out to you? 
Well, I think a couple of things stood out. One was just the rather wide berth that federal agents have to search at the former president's estate. They couldn't go any into any guest houses or to any areas used by members of the golf club at Mar-a-Lago, but they could go into the former president's office and any room that the search warrant said could be used to store boxes or documents. So they could uh, go for a, a pretty wide area in the estate. Maybe that explains why they were there all day on Monday for, for more than eight hours, we think. And when, what they took of various levels of classifications uh, included various documents that, that indicated they were so sensitive, they're only meant to be viewed in a secure location. What the document does not explain, Deidre, is how those materials ended up being removed from the White House and how they ended up at Mar-a-Lago in the first place. Yeah, a big outstanding question for sure. Jeff, bringing you in here and just referring to some reporting from the Washington Post, the FBI searched former Trump, President Trump's home to look for classified documents related to nuclear weapons, among other items. So if true, what position does that put the former president in? I'll leave it with that first and then respond to what you have to say. Well, uh, he's in a position in which he may go to jail. I mean, uh, this is a pretty dark day for the United States. Nobody has really said that, but I know we're all thinking it. Uh, a few days ago, within a, the good old days, we're sort of nostalgic about it. We were just talking about the former president having asserted his Fifth Amendment rights and refusing to answer questions about potential bank fraud and wire fraud. Those are now the good old days. Now we're talking about a finding by a federal judge uh, of probable cause that the former president violated the Espionage Act. And that turns, of course, quickly to why would he do it? What was it that he was uh, doing when he quite deliberately once, twice, three times held on to documents that obviously he knew were top secret, were classified? What was he going to do with them? These are tough questions for us to grapple with, to get our arms around, get our heads around. But that is now what we have to do, get our heads around that terrible question. Uh, Jeff, I'm putting you on the spot here with this particular question, but when you mention the potential of going to jail on a scale of 1 to 10, based on what you know right now, and obviously things can change, how likely is it? Well, put it this way, I, I think that to the extent that, you know, some weeks ago, this was a complex question for the Department of Justice and for the Attorney General whether or not to proceed in the direction of potentially indicting the former president. Unfortunately, what seems to have occurred here has probably clarified the mind of the top leadership team, leadership team in the Department of Justice. How do you not indict somebody who, uh, if the evidence bears this out, we don't know whether it will, how do you not indict somebody who has deliberately once, twice, three times uh, held on to and concealed, certainly he's concealed the classified information in the sense that he disregarded a subpoena for them. And then he apparently, apparently hid it, hid the stuff in a safe and elsewhere. So if those facts are borne out, the question is how does one not, if you're the Attorney General of the United States, proceed in the direction of an indictment? And if there is an indictment, then he is facing uh, potentially years in jail. So speaking of facts that may be borne out, Brad, what about the possibility that the FBI was using an informant to gather information about what was there? Would that change anything? Well, I'm going to guess that they did only because, uh, in particular, a magistrate and clearly prosecutors that reviewed this warrant would want to know, well, how do you know that? Now, if you have an informant that's telling you locations, types of documents, maybe witnesses, witness document, documents being hidden, documents destroyed, all of that stuff really becomes super important as the timeliness of, okay, your, your source said yesterday, we're going in tomorrow, that's pretty good. Uh, but, you know, the other thing with this is if you look at what we've been talking about, about potential federal charges down the road, it, it also tells me the depth of what the agents and the prosecutors know, and which I felt all along they w would have had to have gone that far to execute this search warrant. So you know, there's a lot more to unpack here that obviously we don't know about.
Okay, Brad, thank you. Aaron, Josh, and Jeff, much appreciated. I'm Deirdre Bolton. Thank you for streaming with us. We do want to show you quickly here a live look at the House floor. We are expecting a vote this afternoon on the Inflation Reduction Act. We will obviously bring it to you live as soon as it happens. We're back in just a minute with more news.